good afternoon everyone and thanks for joining us today so in uh, today's presentation basically we'll be touch basing on certain uh, processes that have been existing behind the bim workflows that we have been using for last one decade and uh, basically uh, these workflows uh, and processes what we have been using how we can improvise on them and kind of get more out of them so we're not really going very detailed into every process but we are kind of touching on the macro level of certain items and trying to give a little bit of information about how they are really impacting the way the projects are delivered so let me take you through the discussion now so firstly construction industry as we know is not a very small industry it's a very complicated network of people processes workflows tools technologies softwares and many more things they're all interconnected and sometimes intraconnected also and a complex network of this particular setup is what is helping uh, hundreds and thousands of people deliver a project to highest quality and on time so this is uh, where we are exactly working and uh, definitely it feels very awesome to be part of this complicated network doing our uh, uh, small role of whatever we are doing in our industry then coming to the technology as i just mentioned so we use a lot of technologies starting from be it a small meeting uh, software like what we are using teams or zoom or probably any other bim cad applications or it could be an email system document storage different kind of technologies are used and uh, some of them are directly helping us to do our job but others are kind of uh, helping us to do our job better by contributing to the primary technology so if you go deeper and deeper every software technology or every activity that we do has certain set of rules regulations procedure processes lot of things around it so this is this is a small gist of what we are actually working with so with this told so in today's presentation we are actually going to kind of decode a few things so we'll be touch basing on what exactly is a project life cycle and how this life cycle relates with people workflows processes technologies and other stuff uh, who are actually uh, involved in delivering that particular life cycle then in this context again where bim and information are fitting in and what is a um, role of time in the workflow and also with respect to bim how time is impacting the delivery of bim then we'll be kind of discussing on three areas where we have an opportunity to improvise one is the technology other is processes and procedures and workforce so i'll be taking care till uh, processes and work, uh, procedures and vijayta would be taking over for the uh, workforce <coughs> so let's start basically uh, this is a small uh, representation of the project life cycle so i'm actually talking about a project life cycle that is from the start of the project till the demolition so the project kind of starts uh, what we know the start of project is actually construction so there is uh, before construction a lot of things happen but normally when we say a project we relate it with construction so somewhere it starts and when the construction actually happens we say that the project is started and the construction is over we have an end product which is a physical building in uh, in in the location which we can actually use it now with that the process of facility management would start and sometime in the facility management you would encounter a new problem where you feel that some kind of reconstruction is required or some changes are required and that is where a retrofit kind of process will come in and at the end of retrofit facility management will continue and things will go on like this in a cycle so if you put this graph in a simple way this is how it would look like so the first time construction we normally call it as greenfield and once it is done the utilities are there and probably we are making certain changes it automatically becomes brownfield so this is a simple uh, gist of what is a project life cycle and if i try to put it in a linear way for us to understand for today's presentation let's say we start with project initiation that is somebody has decided that a project is required the next phase of it is planning so we plan a lot of things and once it is all done we start uh, getting into that design so what exactly we want to build and along with design a lot of other work happen where we are trying to understand how it can be built which is called as procurement in simple language and at the end of procurement somebody will come over and take it over and they'll actually start converting design ideas into a physical product which we normally call it as construction or build 
and at the end of build we have a project close up where we return the project to the owner and he starts operating that building so this is a simple life cycle that i'm taking for today's discussion and uh, before the build we normally call it as pre construction and once the construction starts it is called as construction phase same way once the project is handed over the normal terminology used is called as facility management now this is a very simple life cycle but when you look at in the context of different kind of projects like building and infrastructure this could uh, majorly remain the same but there could be a lot of changes so um, sometimes design can come a little bit overlapped with planning and vice versa the same way when it is a green field and brown field there could be many more subdivisions or probably interchanges here and there but overall it would look same and lastly coming to the contracting so depending on how you are going to contract design build design build operate etc there is a possibility that uh, con uh, like subsequent uh, phases might partially get overlapped or merged also so this is the kind of project life cycle that we are all currently working with now having this as a context let's try to understand a few more things now we know the project life cycle and how do people get related with life cycle so um, i've just taken a very few uh, uh, references here there could be many more and uh, the idea is to just talk at a um, macro level so the first person is a client so client exists on the project from the start of the project and at the close out he is called as builder then post that uh, handover is done if he continues to operate he might be called as operator or he might become a owner by handing over the building to somebody so if you see this uh, dark line or the continuous line this is where client is mostly active but after the project close out depending on what is his role he he would stay there till the demolition of the project now the same way when we look at the project management consultants pmcs basically they do exist from the day one but they become very active when the tender documents are being prepared and that is where they come into the limelight and they exist till certain time in operation where the contracts of the contractor are officially getting closed so till that time somebody from pmc exists the same way if you look at the design consultants these are the people who are actually producing the designs ideas documents etc so they exist from the project initiation and they are pretty active until the construction starts and post that they are there to help with any modifications or any other changes that could happen and their work actually comes to an end when the project close out is done and they sign on the as built drawings now if you look at the um people who are constructing so there is a new word called constructors so we are also using that so constructors basically they are the people who convert our drawings and ideas into physical items so it includes contractors vendors original equipment manufacturers and suppliers also now these people normally they are consulted when the design is in Uh, progress because people like uh, design consultants would want to know whether something is really possible what are the pros and cons and etc they exist uh, in a background and not uh, formally on the project informally they exist and uh, they are giving their inputs but once they get the contract they come to the limelight and they are there until the operation starts and everything works fine and they exit the project now coming to the specialty consultants we have many of them so depending on the requirement they are there throughout the project so even after facility takes over also if at all you find that the the context of the project for which it was not built is not working some consultant comes on board he does some kind of uh, analysis and you will come with a some kind of fine tuning so that the building performs exactly what it was designed for so these people they are existent throughout the project and they are indirectly helping all the people above so these are the people that we are actually representing or we are interacting with on our day to day life now coming to the workflows so we are just trying to understand what kind of workflows we are working so coming to something like checks and verifications so this kind of workflows exist throughout your project so right from the time you get your site uh, access you are you start checking whether the site is as per your drawing from that day till the project is done you are continuously doing this checks and verifications for various reasons and the same thing when it completes your project close up most of the data that you have checked here will become variations and deviations so you are checking with the history of that document and you say okay it is not performing well the same way project management so from day one project management exists and it continues now there are different kind of things they do actuals versus proposed deviations root causes so various things are happening by by itself with lot of teams 
Now coming to the design thinking, yes, uh, this is where the project actually starts and this will give the way forward to what is going to be built and how we are going to build everything. And definitely design thinking exists uh, till certain time in build, like let's say you are done with your core of the building and maybe you feel that interest has to be retrofitted, uh, like uh, changed or modified, you are going to do it. So it keeps going on until you are satisfied with the physical product that you see on the site. And uh, uh, definitely post that uh, the construction is done and it is handed over. Also, this kind of continues uh, until the occupant of the building is completely satisfied with what is he using. And coming to the construction methodology, absolutely, we, we start somewhere with how we want to build only, but somewhere during the design and procurement, it is actually getting concrete, like how exactly we are going to build. And when you go for construction, it is finalized. And definitely after this, every kind of construction methodology has a particular maintenance methodology. So the documents which were created here for construction will automatically become how it was created and they will say how it has to be maintained. So this also kind of continues. Now coming to the costing and budget. So definitely money is required everywhere and accounts are whatever we would want to call it. So this exists everywhere, but uh, very uh, um, kind of uh, when one um, Interesting feature of this costing and budgeting is that whatever was costing and budgeting at the end of the project becomes expenditure and the budget which was for construction will become maintenance. So budget remains there, but the purpose changes. So this kind of continues throughout the uh, project until it is demolished. So this is a kind of workflows that we are kind of working with and coming to the processes. So definitely for every workflow, there is a procedure and a particular methodology in which it has to be done. So they, they form the processes. And uh, again, like checking and verification is a process. So uh, there are workflows how to do checking and process uh, like verification, etc. But as it is, it's a process. Then estimation and analysis is a kind of process that we are continuously doing. We are checking what we have designed, what is required. A lot of things we are always on estimation and we are analyzing something to uh, kind of validate that what we are doing is correct. The next one is pilot projects and mock up. So this is a small prototype that we are doing before the project is actually going for a full construction. So if it is being done in design and procurement stage by the client, it is mostly called as pilots. But if it is being done with the contractor on board and to check the capabilities of contractor or whatever is related to contractor, we normally use the word mockups. And many a times mockups are approved and it becomes actual. If not, they are broken and reconstructed. Now, the same items, when it is being done in the facility, it becomes maintenance drills. So for example, if you take an equipment, so putting an equipment together during your uh, pre-construction, it is called pilot. Putting the equipment together just before start of construction is called mock-up. Now, removing the equipment and putting it back during operation becomes maintenance drill. So certain items are common and certain items don't repeat again. Then the next one is contracts, accounts, payments, receipts. So these are all different processes that are continuing throughout the project. So these are certain items that we have been uh, working and now comes the software, the technology that we are using. So there are various kinds of technology. Definitely uh, whatever I've told till now, every item on my previous slides has a technology, but mostly we are currently using technologies around surveying and scanning. And uh, then we have project management solutions project PPMR, EPPM, and we have a lot of ERP solutions, enterprise resource planning solutions, where we are trying to bring together multiple teams on a project to do a complete project delivery. Then we have various CAD, BIM, our virtual design and construct, uh, construction technologies. And nowadays we are also using virtual reality and uh, augmented reality for design uh, checking or probably for explaining the design. So these kind of technologies are also there. Now, all that we do with CAD BIM, when we put it together as one model and hand it over to the client, in a way it can be used for facility management. This automatically becomes digital twin. Then we have a lot of machining, robotics and surveillance. So currently many, uh, many places in construction, we are able to do the activities with robotics and definitely whatever prefabrication is happening, they are kind of using certain type of machining and definitely surveillance. So there are a lot of technologies on site and also post construction on facility management where you can use drones and um, similar kind of devices to keep a surveillance on the property or the activity happening. So 
various technologies are there. Now accounting solutions, so there are many of them. And coming to the facility management, again, there have been a lot of facility management solutions without the power of CAD, then came with power of CAD, then with BIM. Today they are talking about digital twin based facility management also. So they are also there. And facility management today is starting somewhere in build stage. And the contractor is about to hand over. They start working on integration with facility management. And then we have IBMS or BMS, building management system. So they are also very powerful. And today BMS is started taking the capabilities of CAD and BIM for a better representation. Now with all this, when you come to the digital twin as such, so you can see the digital twin, we have given a thicker line. There is a reason to it. So definitely digital twin as it goes further into the life cycle of the project, it is becoming heavier and heavier. It has more data in it. And what has happened today is like, we somewhere started in operations for the digital twin and most of the projects today are getting into digital twin during building and certain projects which have started uh, in last two, three years, they have got this kind of specs written in design stage itself. And probably there would be a uh, time in near future, maybe one or two years, where digital twin will become a mandate in the project initiation itself. So that is basically the client is probably able to say what exactly wants in digital twin. So this is how the digital twin journey is happening. And definitely digital twin has everything that we are talking above or in the previous slides. It is a quality of everything. So these are the technologies we are talking. So with all this said, let's try to kind of also understand BIM and information. BIM that we all know that we have a model which can create drawings and this model is capable of giving you a lot of outputs required for various teams of the construction, starting from business development to handover. But actually what is BIM today is all about is the information. So the model or the drawing or repository, whatever we are talking as BIM. So it is nothing but a very rich data, so a very rich source of various kinds of information. And what we are exactly doing with today's BIM processes is that we are taking out the information, what we want at that time for that activity, for that person or for that deliverable, working with it, putting it back into the repository and that is exactly what we are trying to do. It's it's as simple as you got something on your Google Drive, you access it on mobile application and you are done, you put it back, then you open the same data on your web, you access it, use it, put it back, then you go to laptop, desktop. That is where, that is how the BIM is actually taking shape today. It's more of information and it's it's no more of like drawing. So we are, we are actually talking what is the information I'm storing for everybody on the life cycle of the project. So that is the role of BIM in today's workflows are what we are going to get into from today onwards. That is like later. Now with all this time, time is also a very important aspect before we can understand what are the challenges we have. So let's understand how time is actually uh, there with us and uh, how it actually impacts most of our works. So firstly, the time consumption is not same for every person, every task or every project. It varies by various combinations and definitely if you did something in a particular time span in project A, the same set of people, the same set of workflows, the same timing, everything, if you try to do it in project B, it may or may not happen. There are various reasons for that. So this is the reality of time. And uh, what happens here is certain tasks. So if you look at the project workflow, there are certain tasks which are happening too often and they may take very minimal time, but they happen too often. So every day you do that task and uh, it is not taking too much of time. So there are certain tasks which happen only once or twice in the project. Like let's say project planning, you intensely work on project planning before the start of the project and later you will only work so intensely when project is out of track. If project is going exactly on the track, the project management team is just keeping an eye on what is happening with the project plan and they're just making the update. So they may not put 100% of effort what they put initially. So like that, there are certain tasks which happen during the start and may not happen till the end. Uh, it might only happen at key intervals. And that is when those teams put intense effort to get them sorted out. So this is just two cases. There could be many cases like this. 
Now, if you look at that strength of that team and then the effort and stuff, so there are tasks which are dependent on predecessors. That is very simple example. Let's say the architect's plan is wrong and whoever is referring the architect's plan will obviously have to redo everything. So there is a task which is completely dependent on predecessor and he does wrong. Everybody has to have the rework kind of effect. And there are certain tasks where they are interdependent such that it will affect both backwards and forwards. So let's say for example, the same example of architects drawing. So architect changes the design. Now when architect changes the design, the backwards also it is little affected because he has to go go back and recheck the analysis everything. So whatever he did the planning or probably the budgeting what he gave to client, he will have to recheck everything and resubmit it and forwards. So depending on what is the change in the design, there could be an impact of time, effort, money, lot of things. So I'm just taking a very simple example, but if you go on to site, there could be much more relevant and complicated examples. So there are tasks which can change everything backwards and forwards and there could be certain tasks which may may not change anything. A very simple example, let's say in the site you are supposed to fit a kind of a carbon dioxide sensor or probably a thermal sensor in a room. Now you go to the site and you see the entire ceiling pattern is different from what was it on the uh, drawing it doesn't make so much of difference as long as the size of the room has not changed. You can put it like two feet here and there, it is OK. But the same thing, if you have to do with sprinkler, it is not possible. You might have to come back to your drawing board, rework everything. So like that, there are certain tasks which are independent, may or may not impact also. So if you look at this, one person's work is actually kind of deciding the efforts need to be put by other person and also that time. Now, if you look at the teamwork, let's say the work has really changed. Now, if you look at the teamwork, there are certain works which can actually be div divided among the team members. Very simple. Today we work in BIM and BIM models are collaborative, so multiple people can work on the same model. Now, this wasn't the case with CAD. So we were waiting for one person to complete the work and then I had to open it. So if you also see with Google uh, Office or probably Microsoft Office applications, a while back, they were all single user. So I have to complete, then somebody else can open. But today they all become collaborative where I can work on page one, somebody can work on page two. So certain activities can be divided, certain activities cannot be divided. Then there could be some situation where when somebody is working, others really don't have work, they have to sit idle. As long as they are not on a different project, so they have to sit idle. So the teamwork is also getting impacted. So this is a small understanding on the team. So what is the overall summary is that the construction projects actually need to work intensely at predefined stages to ensure a complete alignment and adherence to the deliverables. And post this, if the project is actually going as per plan, all we have to do on day to day basis is to keep and check on whether daily work is happening as per the plan and update it at our end. If it is not happening, if we can start correcting it timely and inform the concerned teams, absolutely the project will be on track. Now, if we miss out this particular stage of daily updation, that is when we get into the problem. So mostly what we are doing after this first work is that we are doing a daily, daily check of what is planned versus actual. And we are mostly coordinating with multiple teams in exchanging the information continuously and ensuring that we have the right information always. So this is how time is actually being uh, happening with us in our projects. Now, if you try to put back time and BIM together, how does time work in BIM? So for most of the people who are working in BIM, so we always feel that we have less time. The reason is that BIM is happening from the day one till the handover and from today onwards or probably wherever the project is uh, having digital twin, it will continue to happen even in facility management. So BIM starts breathing on the day project is initiated and it will end on the day the project is demolished. So BIM teams have worked throughout the project and definitely the time gone is gone and we cannot make up for the time which is gone 
because we have some work tomorrow. So this is this is a uh, importance of time for BIM teams today. And uh, the other important aspect is that the key to any project, the drawings which actually form the foundation of most of the other documents are derived from BIM and any delay in producing the drawings will have a effect on every process which is kind of interdependent on drawings. So this is also a very important aspect why BIM has to be delivered on time. A small example is if you take a very small conference room in the design stage to resolve a conference room, architect, interior designer, mechanical, electrical, engineers, firefighting engineers, all the people definitely have to sit together, resolve it and say, okay, these drawings are correct for execution. So just look at a small room. If this small room requires a coordination of six to seven people uh, for a day or so, then you can imagine the magnanimity of the project and how complex the workflows are. So it is it's very good that we honor that time and do the activities on time so that we don't creep again that we are short of time. So th that important is time in BIM process. Now with all this said, uh, we'll be jumping into the second part of the presentation. So this was just a kind of uh, overview of why we have to pick the areas that we are going to talk now. Now the first area that uh, we have chosen is standard technology and tools. So basically technology we are referring to the CAD, BIM kind of technology and tools meaning uh, it could be any other software applications or probably plugins, whatever you might use. So in general technology and tools, you can relate it as CAD and BIM applications where we are mostly using and working to make our drawings, documents and all the uh, engineering related outputs. Now, how the technology has been changing. If you see the technology has not been constant for the last 50 years. So since 1970s, um, there is a lot of uh, improvisation. So starting with 2D, we had 3D, then early BIM. Now we have got advanced BIM and today we are talking about BIM for facility management, digital BIM and more. So in the next slides, I'll actually kind of touch base with some new technology trends that are in the market. So firstly, the internet revolution, and this is where everything started, internet becoming accessible to everybody. And with the speeds of 4G, 5G, we are able to do some marvelous things which we wouldn't have been able to do earlier. And all the credit actually goes to the internet revolution. And one of the first important uh, trend that we are talking today is cloud computing. So today we are able to push all our work onto a cloud server and leave it to the server to process the data and give it back. If not, we were using very complicated servers at our offices are probably very high end hardware and uh, different kind of other applications where we were uh, we were kind of like uh, um, I'm sorry. So we were kind of uh, dependent on the local hardware and software to get our works done. And while this was happening, we were we were supposed to sit idle, but today with cloud computing and internet, just a click of button, everything is sent to cloud. You continue to work on some other project and the data will come back to you with the email notification. That's how easy the cloud computing is helping us. And uh, the other technology which is contributing to the cloud computing power is the artificial intelligence and machine learning. So today, a lot of other industries have picked it up and they've started working on it. A small example you can see here. This is an example I uh, picked it up from a service provider of BIM. So wherein they've, they've kind of done a scanning of a uh, um, flyover and using artificial intelligence and machine learning, they're removing the greenery which is around the uh, flyover and they're also converting the flyover into a 3D model. So the AI and ML have started coming into design and they're trying to help us how we can actually make our designs better and faster. So basically using computers, we, we are actually cutting down certain workflows and processes relating to checking our probably um, validation. If not, a team works and somebody has to come check all the inputs before it, it is sent out. So using computer, one clear thing is that the computer does what it is programmed for and it normally doesn't do a mistake or if it is programmed, it can give an alert that something is wrong. So here we are actually indirectly improving the quality of our deliverable 
and we are giving better assurance of what we are delivering. So this technology is going to get more powerful in the time to come. And what is it going to do with BIM is something that everybody is curious to know. Now drones and advanced devices, so this has also been a very big revolution where we were unable to access certain locations in the project during construction or post construction. So we were unable to even check kind of uh, whether the the objects have been really constructed the way it was and stuff with drones and a lot of advanced devices like sensors and stuff we're able to remotely go to an area where human can't go or which is not safe for human being and kind of know what exactly is happening there and come back so this is also just a revolution has started many more things are going to come in construction industry then the virtual reality, so whatever started as uh, a simple application on mobile, today we are talking about mixed reality, experience, reality, then now there is also metaverse also coming in. And this is where we are talking about interacting, interaction between the physical and virtual world. Like for example, if you see the image here, the image on the left hand side is uh, something which is being used in facility management. The guy is ha ha having one digital uh, uh, device, which is probably an iPad or something. And when he goes near the object using the camera, the software is capable of understanding the objects and it is saying what needs to be done, what needs not to be done. And the image on the right hand side is probably uh, some some shed kind of stuff. And if you see the green color elements are coming from virtual world, rest of it is in physical world. The engineer is able to interrelate what is proposed to what exists. So these kind of technologies are actually improvising the way we can exchange the thoughts and we can share our ideas or probably we can educate uh, certain people on what to do, what not to do and stuff like that. So this is also one very revolutionary technology which is contributing a lot to BIM. And uh, coming to the next one, robotics. So robotics have been there from long time, but their usage hasn't been so uh, wide in construction, but in recent times it is also picking up where uh, we, we have been able to do certain things which otherwise human would have been at risk by using robots. So this is one very uh, uh, niche area where a lot of development is happening, especially in the prefabricated building kind of spaces. Then the 3D printing. So this is one more technology where we are trying to build a building like a, by using a printer kind of technology. And uh, this is a very, very good where uh, we don't have construction resources or even the materials for that say in some remote corners of the country or somewhere on earth where we firstly don't have construction resources. We can simply take this kind of printer and definitely construct houses and uh, basic communities with very, very minimal time and minimal resources. So this is also a revolutionary technology for a lot of uh, areas uh, where construction, normal construction is actually little cumbersome. And the lastly, digital twin. So digital twin is a very broad subject and probably we might have to have another session to talk in detail of this. But in the gist, what we are trying to say about digital twin is that we are trying to put all the BIM information together as a 3D model and then take it into the facility management and start collecting the facility information on top of BIM model and use it for various applications like whether it is performing as per its uh, plan or where the changes are required, what are the plan A, B, C, lot of things. This is from the design perspective. Now when it comes to the maintenance and stuff, so all these days the facility management team had to go through lots and lots of drawings, documents to find a small bit of information. But with digital twin, everything is available to them at the click of button. So they can go to any any component in the 3D model, click on it and keep sourcing the data which could be like stored anywhere in uh, anywhere across the world or which could be as old as 10 15 years etc if it is all digitized and there is no limit to any file format most of the file formats work so basically digital twins are making the facility management teams more and more efficient and they are actually getting one wonderful solution which didn't exist earlier so this is this is what about digital twin and another very big revolution coming in the industry so these trends are there in technology. Now, if you look at the construction system, so these are some new systems or new techniques in which construction is happening, 
and these have their own way of working. They may directly fit into the conventional BIM and uh, project workflows are they might require a very different kind of uh, uh, workflow altogether. So one of it is prefabricated buildings. So in prefabricated buildings, very simple is you can't actually design whatever you want, but you might have to go with the machine spec specifications. Sometimes you'll have to pay an attention on the transportation, etc. So they have a particular way of designing. So overall, the the workflow would be same, but the internal uh, sorry, overall the processes would be same, but little bit of workflows here and there could be altered. Now, same way, if you look at the green building are uh, eco friendly constructions. So the objective is fixed that it should be probably platinum rated green building or they should use a particular material in a particular way, etc. So this is where our software technology may may not completely queue 100% output. So this requires a very different kind of uh, uh, understanding and reworking of our workflow of uh, as to how we are going to execute this. So this is also something which is happening and they're actually going to change whatever we have discussed till now. Secondly, the management system. So we are talking about lean construction, common data environment, collaborative working environment. So these these uh, kind of concepts, they bring with them their own certain rules and regulations and we have to honor them with whatever we are doing and kind of create an interface and ensure that the data goes to them at the right time. So this is also adding a kind of complication and end of the day, these three systems are also actually helping the projects get realized faster, accurate and minimize the re rework or duplication and effort. So overall, all this technology is looking at some common objectives and it's, it's really good that we kind of honor them in our workflows and try to adopt them. So these are the trends that we are talking and in a just what is that we are having as challenges, risks and solution is. So basically the challenge is we have to understand one thing is that all the technology looks similar, but they are unique when it comes to their features and functionalities. Secondly, <clears throat> what happens here is every tool might look similar, but they don't give the exact deliverable. That is one. And secondly, uh, if you are expecting everything in one software, that may not happen anytime soon or it may not happen ever. So it's always we have to understand one thing is like we are working in a collaboration of multiple softwares to do a common objective. So that is that is a challenges that we have and shortcomings also, but that is also the reality. So what is the risk here is basically if you are not understanding the features and functionalities of tools and you just end up using it in an incorrect way, you are actually cre creating some information which will become redundant in future. A very simple example is many people they they use cut and glazing for creating railings because there is a glass between bolsters. Now it might sound OK today, but let's say after 10 years somebody goes into the model and checks it and now he's confused. Why did we draw a cut and glazing? in place of railing. So today the tool may not permit or exist, but there should definitely be some workflows in that software and we should not use it in a wrong context because cut and glazing is used somewhere. So another example is ducts. So there is something called bus ducts used in electrical. So many people what they do is in most of the popular BIM softwares, they don't have bus duct tool. So they end up using duct tool for bus duct. So duct is doing a different activity in the project. Bus duct has to do a different activity. But because we find it easy, we use it, which is not right. And the second major risk here is a continuous learning is required. So the tools were changing yearly. Today they have started changing monthly. A lot of new features are coming almost every month. And somebody needs to be continuously uh, in touch with it and ensure that they have 100% information. Uh, so that they can create a knowledge repository and pass it on to next set of people or people in the team. So if you don't do it or if you stop doing it, we are at a risk. Now what is the solution is basically, so we should start looking at having some kind of teams who are project independent, something like BIM hubs or probably some kind of BIM champion groups or some other uh, names you can give, who can actually centrally sit at a location of the uh, company and start evaluating and keep a track of what is happening with software, etc., and create a knowledge repository. Now, this repository could help the ongoing projects or probably the projects which are going to start soon so that uh, uh, they can take the right decisions at the right time and everybody in the project need not really bother about what is what in the software. The second one is that uh, we create a documentation 
and it is also very necessary that uh, the documentation need to be updated properly so that it is always relevant to the day and apart from this it is also important that that documentation not just being a pdf it should also get into the minds of people so as some kind of learning curve has to be defined and some kind of uh, business uh, objectives are probably business processes have to be set so that this knowledge transfer becomes a continuous process within an organization or for that reason for a project which is probably work happening for three to five years. So this is something that we can do so that we can come out of these challenges and start making them technology work better for us. So this is about the technology and tools. The next one is uh, we will just pay little attention on the processes and procedures. So firstly, again, the introduction. So as the technology changed, we have also started moving from individual tasks to workflows and you, we people who are working as independent or in isolation have started working as teams and colla in collaboration. And we were actually trying to do automation by ensuring that I do one, one job and computer gives me another thing, like I draw a plan and section comes. But today we are talking about prediction where I draw something and software is predicting and say, okay, is this the what you are wanting? And coming to IT, we were working on local computers, now we are working on cloud computers checklists and certain documentation has completely become digital. So we no more use paper. Human efforts are being replaced totally with technology. So this is how the transformation has happened in the way we were actually working to what we are working today. Now, if you try to understand BIM also, so I just come out with two scenarios of BIM. So scenario one on left hand side is uh, something where the BIM is centered to your business. So you can relate it with somebody like uh, builders. So a builder uses BIM because he wants to ensure that he will not pay more on unwanted stuff or probably he won't he won't give uh, any like he won't support the creation of RFIs and pay for it and stuff like that. So it's wanting to ensure that his budget is properly used and if possible to reduce the construction cost. That is his objective. So he's keeping BIM at the center of his business. And the next one the scenario two is for people mostly like designers, engineers who are using BIM as a technology to kind of exchange their thoughts with people who are not engineers and the uh, architects. So basically here they're using it as a medium to kind of translate their design into documentation. So these are the two ways that we can see the people are the professionals in our industry. Now, how actually BIM happens in our project? So I have a small uh, workflow. So how does BIM happen today is basically the client who is the owner of the building, he firstly creates a standard operating procedure on BIM, how he expects BIM to happen on a project. So normally it is called as BIM RFP or he creates a overall BIM execution plan, he floats it out. Now this particular thing goes into the project and many other people will also bring their knowledge and together they'll create something called as a project BEP, BIM Exhibition Plan. So they're all agreeing that in this project, we all together are going to work in a certain way. Now, what exactly they're trying to do here is, this is one company, that is another company, they are bringing out their experience, knowledge or know-how on BIM into one project, making it better and making it work for that project. So basically they're taking their prior experience and reworking it to the day's requirement along with advancements, trends, etc., and delivering that project. So once this project is over, they take back the data from the project into their concerned uh, departments and they will improvise their BP and keep it ready for the next project. So this is how most of the construction companies, architects, engineers, contractors, they're all updating themselves uh, project or project. So you know, overall, this is how it looks. So we started a project here and somebody created a SOP, Standard Operating Procedure. So it was created by a company which is a builder. Then it comes into the space of project where it becomes RFP and it gets into your project. So initially it is a pre-construction BEP where it was proposed and later it becomes project or construction BEP where it becomes actual how the model was really prepared and how it was used for construction. So at the end of this construction, it comes back as a learning and update and it travels back to the originator 
who updates and puts it back in the same cycle. So the cyclic process is happening in every project or every team and without our knowledge it is actually happening. So this is how we are actually sharing our knowledge on day to day basis. Now what is the uh, kind of challenges and risks that we are having here is so if you have seen this uh, workflows and uh, complicated technology and stuff it is very uncommon that we can have everybody on the project have the same understanding of uh, the project every workflow every document every drawing everything so it's impossible that can have everybody on the project have the same understanding of everything so this is one thing that we have to understand as a reality secondly wherever technology is involved the technology uh, cannot be just used like that it has some particular uh, flow of workflows or within a workflow there is a flow of task so as a whole there is a process and that process has to be implemented and it has to be used in the right way the workflow should be done in the right way only then the technology works so what happens here is over a period of time technology is continuously changing and it brings in a lot of changes to the procedures that are followed like there was a way we were simply like connecting to cad files some time back now if you look at the cad software they are offering new methods to connect two drawings together now there could be projects which use the old method there could be projects which are using new methods now how do you inform this to the uh, person who is working on the project where to use what and also it brings a very complicated scenario of keeping everybody informed on everything related to technology also now what are the risks on this is basically any delay in updating the procedure will result in under quality of the actual deliverable so we started with a in mind it might become z we don't know so that is one thing and having incomplete knowledge of the tool is also not good uh, because we will end up using wrong tools and features and we will actually be making the final output out of the place for tomorrow. So this is the kind of risk that we, we have with the processes and procedures. What is the solution is the best thing we can do is like uh, before we start any project today, we definitely have sufficient manpower within our organizations and industry. So at least have one or two people start with that project and these people should have the similar project experience. That is, uh, we should not put somebody who worked on a high rise residential building into a commercial project and expect him to do everything. So residential wouldn't have used every engineering system used in commercial. So if you can try to get somebody with a relevant experience like now there was a person who probably helped build an office building, but today we are wanting to build a hospital space. OK, it is OK to put an office guy into uh, office as long as that office building had all the services that normally has to be there in office like MEPF and other complicated services. If it is there, yes, he is somebody who can start with and over a period of time he can know about very specific things about the hospital kind of projects. So this is something that we can start with and the person who goes into the project need to stay there for some time. He should not be just there for uh, a very few months, but he should be there definitely for some time until somebody below him or the actual team gets set up there and they're able to handle it by themselves. And the next one is tools. So the best way to use the software is use it in the context what the software developer has created. Don't use cut and walls or ducks for something which is it not meant for. Just use it in the context of what the software developer did. And if there is something uh, which is not available, the best way is to go back to the developer. And also don't try to use every workaround that you might see it on YouTube or in public domain. There are people who are very fascinated about BIM. They try to do this, but they would never give a caution what would be the implication of using a tool wrongly. It is not their work, they won't do. But definitely before we use it in our workflow, we should be very much aware of pros and cons of that. So this is one very, uh, very simple thing that we could adopt. And lastly, conducting a reskilling. So what happens nowadays is when we say reskilling trainings at companies, it's more of become a PowerPoint presentation or a videos. But what exactly is required is the teams have to experience the technology. So if we can set up something like a BIM studios where the people who are attending the training gets 
completely detached from the projects. They form a team temporarily for a day or a week and they use the technology in the right way on a sample project and experience what exactly the technology does and what will happen if they do something <coughs> wrong. So when we are talking about collaborated working, we are not creating a collaborative training firstly. So that is where we have to eye at. And secondly, a practice based training is very powerful than theoretical training because whatever we see, we don't remember. Like for example, I've been talking and there is a lot of content on our slides. So people who are listening to me might not have read the content. People who are reading the content might have lost a flow with my speech. So this is a problem that humans have. So the best way is you make them work and feel it so that they remember. So this is one very simple thing that we could do to create a uh, uh, like to enable knowledge transfer in a right way. So this was about two aspects of improvisation. Now I will hand it over to uh, Vijeta and she would be taking us in uh, very detailed uh, understanding of workforce. Right now, it's been a very vast uh... Uh, analysis done by uh, Arun regarding the technology part, processes part, the importance of standards, and how does uh, the standards and the project life cycle with various contracting mechanisms, how do you have to choose? Uh, because construction project, unlike your uh, manufacturing industry, it requires a unique way of approach. Those standards, policies, technological tools prevail, but finally it is the human input and the human skill set or abilities is what that matters most. So here, uh, since I am coming from the education sector for the past uh, three and a half years, uh, so I would like to highlight importance of uh, BIM professional what sort of skill set they need to possess and what is the kind of current status of the education sector with respect to BIM curriculum that is happening. So can you uh, just see my screen, right? Like if you see this, this is a typical construction uh, project team structure that it has. So you have on the left hand side the client side different entities or different stakeholders at the uh, headquarters level, regional level, project level. And then you have the project management team right from the different functionalities or the cross discipline uh, team from the legal administration. And on the right hand side, you have got other type of interesting stakeholders uh, where they do lot of they do have a lot of interdependency with respect to the information flow where they need to contact with each other. And that's where, as we all know, that information plays a vital role in the building information modeling way of working. These entities, consultants and construction contractors, along with allied uh, subcontractor or the vendors or the OEMs, need to understand what sort of curriculum that they need to possess right from the educational uh, point of view, or in other words, grassroots level of education. So I start with. So I begin with the concept of T shaped professionals, BIM professionals. So what is this T shaped professionals that I'm specifying over here? So currently we are in an age of knowledge generation. So every now and then we see an omnipresent knowledge that has been generated and it has been traded and it has been used for various purposes. And here comes the T-shaped professionals where during the time of this knowledge based society or the knowledge economy, what uh, one of the key research uh, uh, inputs which we uh, gathered from the literature. How does a knowledge economy different from the regular uh, financial economy? So a knowledge based society or a knowledge economy has been specified from one of the recent literature where lot of emerging technologies are arriving, right? So you need to have these four things that are happening. Like you have the dissolution of the value chain, 
globalization of the competition that is happening, convergence of plenty of technologies like as Arun has specified, the emergence of construction 4.0 related technologies, and finally, the integration of knowledge from all the processes, standards, and from the people with the use of technologies. These all four constitutes the knowledge economy as per some of the literature that has been uh, come from the BIM related curriculum. So who is a T-shaped professional? A person who is having a deep exposure or an expertise in a particular topic and is having a steep experience. That means, uh, for instance, I'm having work experience of 10 years. And if I have also very deep knowledge of BIM and that knowledge of BIM is not just concentrated only for one type of project, rather it has been used for different types of projects. What happens is I gain proficiency with respect to knowledge as well as I gain the proficiency with respect to practice. So nowadays when we are living in a generation of uh, information, no longer a specialist is required. Organizations are looking for T-shaped professionals and this is where T-shaped BRIM professionals is what uh, in most of the BIM curriculum related aspect it needs to include and try to develop the graduates. So if I try to uh, give you a construction setting where the project ecologies would look like, you have construction team which is actually bounded in different stages. You find different entities coming into picture. So when you have in the initiation phase, you have different corporate groups or uh, various uh, statutory bodies where you need to take the uh, approvals, suppliers, certain private clients, public clients. And when you go to the design phase, you have certain federal or state related entities that input might be required. And sometimes market related outcome or output or stakeholders inputs is also required during construction. And during the usage phase, you try to accommodate or try to involve with the other personal professional networks to understand how is the particular project facility when it is handed over is working. So let me explain you what is this T-shaped professional and how this knowledge paradigm is different. So when I consider this T-shaped, so when I Check with the left hand side that is the experience from the knowledge or whatever uh, expert expertise that you're getting from knowing how to use some XYZ tool and all that constitutes the I portion of the T. And when you go to the horizontal part of the T section that constitute your practice component where whatever that you have learned in the I section would be implemented in various projects. So you get a broadened horizon and you get to know a process that is codified knowledge. So when we combine both this vertical integration and horizontal integration, you, you in the sense the professional would get the breadth of the knowledge and depth of the knowledge in the form of experience and training. So when we look at the process of delivery that needs to happen for a BIM curriculum, so we find here even every now and then a lot of traction of BIM as well as other advanced technologies has increased, uh, especially uh, post pandemic situation. And we find every now and then different commercial softwares that are prom promoting and promulgating different uses, use cases and all, but they are not context specific. So here comes the picture where the BIM curriculum has to be curated in such a manner. So there needs to be certain four phases or the four gateways. So firstly, there need to be some sort of abstract conceptualization that needs to be integrated to a student's mindset. That means where they can learn the tool at a pilot project level or some prototype model in the software. And then they have to next go to the active implementation level where they try to do various sorts of 
uh, different assumptions, constraints that they try to give, experiment it, and then they present in some conferences, workshops, or seminars, and then they try to get certain feedback. And then they need to go for the concrete experience where they have to have hands on experience in the real world case where they have uh, constraints that are coming into picture, which is not envisaged just in the laboratory based or theoretical based learning that they got. And finally, once they have got the real world experience, it's not a tool shouldn't be a tool or a technology or a process shouldn't be just looked at a mere uh, input output kind of system. So when you get the outputs or the inference or the findings that you get, you need to understand what is the reflection or the what is the reflective thinking that you need to possess for the kind of results that you get. And that's where the reflective observation comes. And through that reflective observation, they can have a lot of discu discussions and uh, important implications that might uh, in, that might uh, hamper or it might also ameliorate the organization or the industry related aspects. So why do we need to go for horizontal and vertical uh, components that needs to be integrated in the education system? So the current education system is purely imparting the what and uh, what and how components. So what is what or how means Suppose the what component constitutes like what is the ingredient of this particular steel grade and how component consists of like how do I uh, do the compaction or backfilling of this particular site. So they teach at the educational level what and how components that is the I component of the T. However, they will not teach you and they are not teaching much about the from concept. That means the practice or the experiential learning concept. And that is the saddened part. And how can we improve that? So if we look at. Also, there are certain uh, curriculums that are imparting real world experience, but just real world experience alone is not the only criteria. The students should become an independent thinking where they need to integrate multiple experimental tools, processes, standards into their curriculum so that they become self-sufficient with having proper knowledge sets to face the real world challenges. And how to understand this horizontal and vertical terminologies? So traditional learning doesn't uh, incorporate the situational experience or the situational learning. and there are certain exceptions in certain sectors, uh, especially if I uh, mention you about the healthcare sector. So they have this practice component before they venture into the professional career. And I feel that BIM also needs to have that kind of integration into this educational curriculum where a beginner or a novice. If you see on the right hand side of this diagram, there is uh, concentric circles. So a beginner or a novice should start through various uh, through undergoing various pedagogical uh, interventions. They need to understand about the concepts and get through the experiential way of collaborative interactions and engaging and then only they get the mastery or the expertise. In various community of practices. So what are the tenets that we can suggest? So from the uh, some of the seminal studies which I have just uh, researched, I found that first tenet they can opt is the educational policy. So there is this vertical component that is where they are, they are being graded at a stage wise or a sequence wise depending upon the subjects which are how uh, demanding uh, in their uh, in their rigor that needs to be put in. And there is this horizontal alignment that is matching with the subject contents with their assessment. And the second tenet is transformative culture. In certain universities, uh, I mean international universities, a truly educated graduate is considered to offer some sort of value addition to the society. And they are considering BIM as one of the fundamental fulcrum or a lever where it is embedding or it is trying to inculcate certain 
uh, key learning objectives and uh, project uh, uh, outcomes also in when they try to implement BIM way of uh, pedagogy. So when they implement BIM, they are getting to understand about the fundamental engineering applications. They're getting the digital literacy skill set in the real world. They're able to co-locate, uh, uh, interact with the co-located teams, coordinate with the co-located teams, possessing better communication skills and teamwork skills, which is uh, a very um, uh, not so favorable uh, aspect that happened a few years ago with respect to construction sector. And uh, as the construction industry is considered as a fragmented and uh, compartmentalized kind of industry, BIM is trying to offer a collaborative, interoperable and integrative solution to them. So another third tenet that can happen is having interaction amongst the students. So when there is this engineering college curriculum, if you see, there would be junior cohorts and the senior cohorts. So when these junior cohorts are getting advice from the senior cohorts, for various kinds of uh, projects. They are getting a guidance from the senior cohorts and senior cohorts can get the advantage because uh, there is always a saying that you tend to retain much knowledge when you're trying to explain a concept. If, if a concept is being easily explained and it can be easily understood by a kid or a person who is much younger than you, then you have been successful in uh, retaining that knowledge and you have acclimatized with that knowledge and that's what the senior cohorts can possess and what happens when this kind of collaborative uh, nature is being uh, generated they possess better interpret uh, interpersonal and collaborative skills to face the real world challenges and another interesting aspect that can happen when BIM curriculum is uh, provided in a more integrated uh, fashion with uh, horizontal and vertical alignment is current curriculum is just concentrating only on cognitive domain blood but there is this bloom's taxonomy there are different levels at which the skill set of uh, the student will be evaluated they are having this absence of effective domain and psychomotor domains so these domains can also be embedded to, uh, while uh, imparting this BIM curriculum. And also the fourth tenet is having accreditation. So in addition to gaining just domain specific knowledge, again, an accreditation with their chosen profession is being given. So certain examples are Daiken University and this University of Rochester. They have in their curriculum graduate level learning outcomes and development vectors, which are promoting BIM as one of their curriculum, I mean, like as one of the part of the curriculum to make sure because BIM is inherently providing these curriculum based outcomes. So if you can see here, digital literacy, critical thinking, problem solving, all these certain skill set are being easily developed when BIM related curriculum is being integrated. So let us now look at how can we have a different way of teaching or pedagogy that can be integrated when BIM curriculum is formulated. So uh, some of the research studies, uh, uh, seminal articles, uh, I have found out that a pedagogy should be such a prepared in such a manner, it should be related in such a manner, it should be a systematic mechanism so that it gives or facilitates realization of learning outcomes in a more predictable manner with a controlled result. So here pedagogy means any conscious activity by one person that is designed to enhance learning by another. So here we already come to know that the current era is apart from information, we have got this knowledge economy which has become ever pervasive. So when this knowledge economy has become so pervasive, it is very difficult for an individual to upgrade themselves to a rapid extent where every two or three months we find newer version of softwares or tools that are coming into picture. So there comes, it is imperative that everybody needs to work as a team of complementary specialists rather than become again a specialist of, I mean like different silos specialists. So here we are slowly moving from 
individual two teams and bim professionals require deep expertise and when a t shaped bim professional needs to be produced from the university or a college or a institute they need to have a convergence of deep expertise and deftness to assemble coordinate and leverage the complementary experience and construction industry most of the time it is application oriented except for few scenarios where the teaching and learning is purely having a trial and a trial and error basis and most of the time the curriculum or the courses that is designed are also compartmentalized into different packages of subjects so by the time the student comes out of the college or just before giving out their capstone project they are not in a position or they are having a very little understanding how to bring the project management knowledge the contracts knowledge or uh, the kind of quantity serving knowledge together to resolve the real world challenges and this is again becoming another siloed and abstract way of working so let us understand what sort of pedagogical approaches that we provide so that workforce related to bim can be improvised so bim professionals core function is problem solving and this problem solving is not just individual it is interdependent and it is mostly reliant on the team's contribution so when this kind of situation is there the normal pedagogy doesn't work and constructivism learning theory and there are also certain other pedagogical uh, uh, theories like the behaviorism which also can be adopted but majority of the time constructivist constructivism learning theory is very much applicable so what does this say so instead of giving the students or the executive employees who are doing certain post graduation diploma programs instead of giving them uh, spoon feeding or hand holding uh, kind of exercise we need to give them problem based learning and project based learning pedagogy so here it is a student led learning rather than an instructor led learning that is happening so what happens in this problem based learning framework is a particular problem is a definitive problem is provided and a team is there to resolve that by providing different solutions that is one type and the second category of problem based learning is they are put into a context and they need to define what are the Uh, problems uh, what is the problem that is existing and then they need to propose the solutions and project based learning is you have a definitive context and you solve the situation uh, uh, the you solve uh, with the various solutions that you come out of it so here what happens in this both kind of learning frameworks uh, pedagogies when they are implemented so the constructivism roots are found in both this project based learning and problem based learning so what it advocates so here this type of learning advocates the self in learning as they adjust their mental models to accommodate new experience in search for meaning so when you are left alone uh, in a very problematic situation without any help of other people what happens you try to devise various solutions and then then you try to come out of it so here the self in learning is for instance you have been uh, uh, taught microsoft project uh, uh, scheduling tool so for the first time when you do it might have taken one hour but when you do second time third time probably it would have consumed much lesser time and why did that happen because you had that experiential learning so second time third time when you have done that same similar exercise what happened is your mental mapping that is happening in the mind at try to learn through the learning curve and found out certain easier ways or easier processes so that you could reduce the time compared to first time when you have attempted so here an experience so constructivism learning theory or this project based or problem based learning it advocates the individuals to have an experiential learning or a situational learning and this is something like an experience can never be taught you need to experience that and as experience cannot be taught and understanding origins from the perceptions from individual perspectives and lenses so in the construction industry as 
a project is quite unique. Every project is unique. Similarly, you cannot have a kind of universal lens that can be looked at for all the pedagogy. This is I seem to be a misunderstood. This is purely this is purely an engagement. So how do we overcome this horizontal and vertical BIM education? Uh, so there is a pathway forward. So first and foremost, you need to have a rich and relevant conceptual BIM content, followed by which there need to be a content themes that has got interface with various uh, interdisciplinary teams. And then you can deepen this BIM skill set by having uh, by learning advanced uh, modules and then you can have an exposure to broader level and peripheral issues through some sort of uh, research that you can do and how it is having an impact on the AEC industry. And then you can go for further problem based learning and project uh, based learning format and then where you can develop this team based management and interpersonal skill set and further to which you can have peer driven interactions either in the form of mentor mentee or mentorship and then you can go for a collaborative learning and finally you can have a real world focus on it so as arun kumar has pointed out standards processes are quite very important and along with this uh, having proper workforce understanding the various sorts of nuances at the grassroots levels, especially at the educational forefront is still more important because a tool, a tool, a person with a tool uh, may not, uh, a, a tool exists, but it is the workforce that is utilizing it and even the process. So however, there are few challenges and shortcomings and risks and implications which we'll, we have very short, uh, we'll be discussing. So yeah, the challenges and shortcomings here are having limited exposure to CAD, BIM and other digital workflows. So not every company is uh, tech savvy or uh, having uh, funds or the financial capability to include. So there is that lacuna and exposure to project workforce, personal or milestones or the stages is also lacking. And also if they have uh, included in their organization the usage of various CAD tools or BIM tools, in-depth knowledge is not provided to everyone. So there is only few specific uh, roles that has been uh, accommodative of this kind of knowledge. And risks and implications if you see, so what sort of length or the time period you're giving for the probationary period for that person to take up all the uh, learnings and also observation needs to be done whether the full time probation is being effectively being utilized or is it being just uh, said uh, just um, remaining in an idle state and how do we have the solution for this workforce first and foremost there should be a vigorous change in the curriculum especially refining and redefining the syllabus uh, relating to the digital workflows if it is uh, not being implemented and certi certified skill co skill courses on digital uh, workflows is also uh, recommended. So like if I see here uh, in various uh, overseas countries and also some of the construction projects are mandating a project manager to possess project management professional or uh, uh, if a person, if a professional needs to uh, give a rating to a building, green building rating, lead rating, that person needs to be an accredited professional of um, different specialization. Similarly, for BIM also, there need to be a credential that uh, gives a competency, that gives a sense of competency that particular person possesses through certified skill courses or certified credentials. And last but not the least, uh, there should be some minimum syllabus that needs to be curated in collaborate collaboration with the various software OEMs. And finally, I uh, conclude that it's vital to address BIM processes and team to get the most out of BIM. So uh, 